thought I'd start off and just ask a question. When you were kids, think back, for some of us it's longer than others. When you were children, what were your dreams? What did you want to be when you grew up? Anyone? Adult. <laughs> some of us are still working towards that. <laughs> a princess. <laughs> a princess. You're nearly there, you've nearly made it. Anyone else? June? Um. <laughs> no dreams whatsoever. No dreams whatsoever. That's not uncommon. Um, as for me, my passion as a kid was football, unsurprisingly, uh, being a boy. You know, Women's World Cup is on at this time. Equality. <laughs> um, my passion was football, and I, I wanted to be a professional footballer. Clearly, um, that's never happened. By the age of 15, I was desperate to leave school. I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I, I just wanted to leave school. I had no real dream about how life would turn out. So I begged my dad for an application for the bank where he worked, having said many years that I would never join the bank he worked because of all the hard work and the hours he put in. And at age 16, I started work. 29 years later, I'm still there. <laughs> Rest a bit. I'm still there. and. I can't say I've fulfilled a dream in life. Banking's a job. At times it's my passion, but it's not my passion in life. It doesn't drive me every day. I was able to choose though. My parents wanted me to do A-levels. But I had the option, I had the choice that I could leave school if I had a job. I chose to buy my first house. I chose to ask Anthony out on a date one week later than I should have done. I chose to marry Anthea. We chose to have children. We chose, we chose throughout our life, mainly I chose and Anthea agreed. <laughs> or she let me think that I chose. But I, I've had choices in all my life and tonight this is really about people who don't have the choices. There are people around in our community, people we may know, people in the wider UK, people in the wider world who can't make the choices that others make because things have happened to them. I'm going to hand over to Anne for a minute because I've gone on long enough. But I was able to choose my path in life. A couple of quotes to just finish on and dwell on. And these are by a guy called Steve Maraboli. I, I've never heard of him but I got them off the internet. I, I like them. The first one was I find the best way to love someone is not to change them, but instead help them reveal the greatest version of themselves. And that's what Restore the Years is about. You can't change people, you can't make people change, but you can help them. You can help facilitate their growth, learn who they are, help them to change as people that way. And the last one sort of sums up the thing I was saying about choices. The power of just one moment can propel you to success and happiness, or chain you to failure and misery. I've been fortunate in my life to make choices which have propelled me to happiness, but there are people out there who have had choices thrust on them by things that have happened to them, who aren't able to make the choices that I've made in life. Things have happened to them, it's led to misery and other things in their life. And I think I've gone on long enough. So, warm welcome out here. I'll hand over to you. Thank you. I'd save the applause to after. <laughs> Um, yeah, thank you, and I'm really grateful that you've all taken the time out of your busy schedules to come tonight, and especially on Monday, it's not everybody's favourite day. <laughs> thank you. So, Restore the Years. This is a charity that I'd like to set up. Yes, on the Isle of Sheppey, but it's secular, it will be for everybody, for all those that are affected by sexual abuse. We will be committed to being an effective, respected charity within the community and dedicated to providing relevant services for those affected by sexual abuse. Our aim 
will be to help transform lives, to make a difference, to support and facilitate clients in finding their identity and their self-worth and purpose. I'm sure you will believe that we all have a purpose. There is a reason why we're here. What I'd like to talk to you about now is my story and my experience of what's brought me here today to set up a charity Restore the Years for those that have been affected by sexual abuse. I was locked in my past. This was very much the case for me. Um, I was stuck in that, that inner child stage of seven and eight, which is when the abuse started. And the inner dialogue, if you like, um, when I was that age was, I need approval. You know when you're a child and you've done something well and you need that acceptance and praise from a teacher or your parent. I felt that that was, I was stuck at that stage, even in adult life. When I first met my husband, if I wasn't very, feeling very good about the way I looked, I, I felt like I needed to constantly ask him, do I look okay? Or if I was doing a job, I remember doing the MVQ3 in childcare and, and not feeling confident that I didn't have what it took to pass that MVQ level 3. I was periodically abused um, from the age of about 7 and 8 and this continued till I was about 10, 11 and it was periodically. Eventually I found the bravery and the courage to uh, disclose to one of my sisters that this had happened to me and to cut a very long story short my parents found out. Now this all happened in the 1980s and as most of us aware, are aware that in the 1980s it wasn't an issue that was spoken about. We didn't really like to acknowledge that that kind of thing was going on behind closed doors. So the help and support that I needed wasn't available for me. So it was no reflection on my mum and dad. They did the best they could with what they had at the time. <coughs> What my parents did do is they made sure, this was an extended member of the family, they made sure that all contact ceased and that the perpetrator wasn't left alone with me or my sisters. I was signposted to a lady, she wasn't a counsellor, but she was a dear friend of the family, a trusted friend that I could go to and talk about my thoughts, and my feelings, my experiences, which I valued and appreciated. Once those meetings with the lady ceased, um, I tried to carry on with life as normal as I could. <laughs> normal for me was being very insecure, lacking confidence, I was very timid, and um, was very afraid to ask for help, or even to acknowledge what I was going through. I felt ashamed, I felt that I should be coping with what had happened to me, that I would look around at everybody around me and compare myself where everybody else seems okay. I knew two or three others that had been through what I had been through and they seemed okay. But now I'm realising there were masks that people were wearing. I tried to wear a mask, but I don't feel I did a very good job. Uh, I used to have a couple of people say to me during that chapter of my life that I would smile but they could see sadness in my eyes. I had a breakdown as a result of carrying this burden and this heavy load alone and trying to deal with it all myself. So I had a breakdown, made a very serious attempt to my life and that's when I was admitted into hospital. I went down, my weight loss went down to about six and a half stone. This is me when I was 30. Very thin, <laughs> gaunt, very poorly looking. Um, these are the things that I was feeling and had been feeling since the abuse started. Now, I did want to mention before the abuse started, from the time I was born till I was seven, 
I was described by my parents as very happy, very bubbly, very carefree. I was innocent. And my parents have said, now they look back and they know everything, they can see when you, you started and when I had changed. So these are the things that I was feeling and that I went through, and, and this was until I was 30 and had the breakdown, really. I was completely unaware that the abuse had had such an impact, a devastating impact on my life. So as you can see there, shame, I was broken, I felt dirty, which made me feel, feel very insecure because I really believed that what I was feeling, everybody could see and that therefore nobody liked me. Felt very rejected, <clears throat> a lot of self-hatred, I hated who I was. Especially when I was comparing myself to everybody else, they seemed confident and competent and managing their lives, they were fully functioning. I was angry, full of resentment, wondering, I wonder who I would have been if this abuse hadn't happened to me. I wonder what I could have achieved, I wonder who I'd be, what I'd be like. I was lost, confused, I had no purpose, I didn't know where I was going in life. My achievement at school was very poor as a result because of the lack of confidence. I felt helpless, didn't know how to help myself. The inner turmoil and say very suicidal um, by the time I got to the age of 30. <clears throat> so for four years I was in and out of hospital. The first stint was four months where I received intensive care, intensive treatment, uh, different types of interventions, very supportive staff actually from the NHS, very supportive, had no complaints. This is a picture of me now, <laughs> after the four years in and out of hospital and embarking on a counselling training course which has been five years and I have Four of my peers at the back there who have also passed their counselling training course. It's been quite an achievement. Well done. And these qualities, these are close to my heart because I'm. This is where I am now. This is where I would like to support victims support them towards this on their journey towards being blameless to leave the shame and the guilt at the feet of the perpetrator it's not their shame and guilt to own to see healing to see fully functioning people when we unconditionally accept them and don't judge them no matter what issues they bring or experience they bring when we unconditionally accept them without judging they are more likely to trust us and, and let their walls down to walk with them towards their feelings of self-worth, to have confidence, to find that inner peace instead of inner turmoil. For them to see that they have life and a purpose, that they can set themselves goals, that they, they have choices, as my husband was saying, choices to make the changes that are right for them, to find solutions, to walk forward and, and stand strong on their own in a strength and hope. The Restore the Years I would very much like it to be about validating their feelings. I remember often um, feeling alone and um, just not validating at all. This was, it had been said to me at the time that you're making this up, you're a drama queen. So yeah, we're here to, with open doors, validation is very important when you're a victim of sexual abuse. This is our logo. Now, this is quite funny. I gave my daughter some very, very messy scribbles and said, this is what I'd like the logo to kind of look like. Um, and she came up with this amazing picture. So what, what the picture is trying to represent, and this is what I described to my daughter a few weeks ago, is that this is, and it's genderless, I know we have a girl at the moment, but we're going to make some tweaks, we're in the early stages, but it's genderless, but it's metaphorically holding them while they're walking this journey towards wholeness, and gradually they pull themselves up and walk on their own, that's our dream. I feel it does encapsulate how, what Restore the Years will be about. <laughs> So 
So what is sexual abuse? Sexual violence and abuse can be defined as any behaviour perceived to be of a sexual nature which is unwanted and takes place without consent. Sexual assault covers any sort of sexual violence and behaviour that is unwanted, ranging from touching to any other activity that is sexual. What is rape is when someone has penetrative sex with another person against their will. Who are the victims? Now, victims can be anybody. No one is exempt. No one. There's no different categories. Anyone could be victims. Any boy, girl, age. Regard. Yep. Yeah, so there, regardless of whether they are male or female. Right, if we could look now at the signs, symptoms and effects of sexual abuse. The first picture I've chosen, I chose it because it's very much how victims walk through life. There are sticky plasters over the scars that are caused and the wounds. But without the correct support, that's how it stays, and it stayed for me until I was 30. They were just sticky plasters over what had happened. So here we're talking about mental health. These are the effects. And for me, I had I was actually diagnosed with OCT. And not many people have heard of OCT. This is obsessive compulsive thoughts. Um, now what had happened... Because of the abuse and other things, it all got muddled in my mind. Um, and because I already believed that I was dirty, this continued 24-7 around the age of 30. And I got to the point where I couldn't cope with the thoughts that were there all the time. I actually dreaded going to bed because I didn't want to wake up because I knew what I would be waking up to. Depression. Depression is very common in sexual abuse victims. And as a result, they're twice as likely to attempt to make attempts on their life. Emotional difficulties. This is something that really resonates with me. Just the feelings of ang anger and resentment, as I had mentioned before. The shame. I really felt that it was my fault. I, I'd had things said to me by the perpetrator, such as, well, if she didn't like it, why didn't she stop me? So the... The guilt, the guilt and shame I definitely owned. Afraid, I was afraid of all males. I, I didn't feel safe with any men at all. It took me a long time to come to that place where you realise, actually, there are a lot of men out there that can be trusted. <laughs> um, and again, low self-esteem. Physical problems, and these are very common, especially self-harming. Because of the pain that you're feeling on the inside, and I self-harmed when I first broke down, and for me, and I've spoken with other victims, it's about diverting the pain that you're feeling inside, you're diverting it onto physical pain, and just for a few moments, it's a relief of, of the inner turmoil that you're feeling. Weight issues, again, I went down to six and a half stone. Self-harm, eating disorders, the weight loss, panic attacks. I suffered from panic attacks when I was 20. Now, I was one of these girls that used to keep journals um, when I was a teenager. And going through the journals, there's many uh, quotes in there. I'm feeling really depressed today and I don't know why. Um, and then in my 20s, I started to have panic attacks and didn't have a foggy. Why? I really didn't. I had no idea of the impact that this, the abuse had had on me. Very clingy. I remember mum saying to me as a child, I'll oh, get off Anthea, why are you always clinging? It's because I needed that constant affirmation that somebody loves me. Addictions. This is very, this, because you, you have feelings of isolation, you feel alone. More often than not, drugs and alcohol and other things like that can be company for victims of sexual abuse. 
and acting out. Revictimisation, this is also very common because the, the adult survivor of childhood, se childhood sexual abuse, they have unhealthy boundaries. They do not know how to keep themselves safe. This is the fun bit, the statistics. <clears throat> this was for my husband's benefit because he works in the bank and loves numbers. I did this for him. <laughs> <laughs> so the next slide shows police recorded crime statistics for sexual offences from all 44 forces in England and Wales over a 10 year period. The total offences are also broken down into two categories, rape and other sexual offences. As you can see, for the 12 months of 2014, the police recorded sexual offences rose 32% from 2013. This is an increase of 19,428 recorded offences. And when compared to 2008 and 9, the rise was 60%. Rape alone was up by 40% on 2013, and this is an increase of 7,604, and more than double the figure recorded in 2008 and 9. I'm sure you can all agree this is quite prolific. Other se sexual offences rose by 28% on 2013, and this is an increase of 11,821 and 44% compared to 2008 and 9. One third of sexual offences recorded by the police are against children. <clears throat> One in 20 One in ten, 20 children in the UK have been sexually abused. And I find this quite daunting when you consider, imagine that a classroom, being in a classroom, being a teacher, one in 20, that someone in your classroom, if you're a teacher, is being abused. 90% of children is a huge percentage were sexually abused by someone they know. One in three children sexually abused by an adult did not tell anyone, and this was the case for me. It went on for a few years before I found the courage to tell anybody. And I think this, this is a huge thing for a child to hold from their own. Yes, and there it says the problem is much bigger than showing official statistics because there are many that don't come forward, don't, haven't got the courage, can't find the courage within them to come, come forward and disclose that this is happening to them. Around 65% of women who ring the rape crisis phone line are adult survivors of childhood sexual abuse, 65%. And I think this reinforces uh, what I said earlier, that re-victimisation uh, re happens and it's very common. So who are the victimisers? Now again, many of them are not strangers. In my case it was an extended member of the family, it could be a friend of the family and people from all walks of life. Scotland Yard reported in 2000 that one in 200 adults are paedophiles. Offenders pick up on the subtle clues when choosing a victim and this, this resonates with me too because um, that was a, quite a process that I went through, that why has this person targeted me? And more often than not, they know, they pick up on the clues in children, the ones that, who are timid, the ones that aren't going to be bullshit and say, hey, you're doing this to me, this is wrong. Um, and to give an example, so this is very much how I was back then. A, a, a very timid 
that was very timid, very shy. I didn't feel I was worth anything. And then a confident, open the door, I'm a value. <laughs> Can you open the door to me, please, just to give you an example? So what can Restore the Years do for the community? And that's why we're really here today. Before I do go on to this, I'd like to just show you a couple of examples that I've got over here. Now, all of you who have daughters or granddaughters or nieces, I'm sure you'll agree with me that most of them would want this pile of toys <laughs> compared to this pile of toys, if you can all see. They've got two piles of money, I don't know if you can see in the back, but at the front there we've just got shrapnel, coppers and then good old paper money there. I wanted to talk about grooming as well and how this happens. Now, when I was a child, my sisters, I have two sisters and they're here tonight and I can remember more often than not they'd be saying to me, why does it always get better presents than we do? So I would have, to give you an example, I had one year a record player. Now back in the 80s, they were expensive. <laughs> I had a record player and LPs, albums. I don't really know what my sister's got. I can't, I really don't remember, but I do remember that. Why do you always get better presents than we do? Also, pocket money, when it came to Christmas cards, birthday cards, Easter time, I'd be the one with maybe not £5 notes, £10 notes, but it would be the larger amounts of money and I don't know what you've got in your 50p, 50p there you go. <laughs> so it's just to give you a visual idea of grooming, I was made to feel special. This man would spend time with me. Um, he would take me away on camping holidays or fishing trips. So yes, what Restore the Years would do for our community. We would like to provide one-to-one -one counselling, a listening and supporting service where we're normalising what they are going through. Because very often we feel that the feelings, the feelings are just us. Nobody else is feeling this, it's just me. So it's about normalising it for them. Giving them trusting therapeutic relationships and referrals where necessary. Now the trusting therapeutic relationships are crucial because where these victims have been abused, they do not know how to trust. And we want to create that trusting environment where they feel safe enough to let their walls down and tell us what has happened and where we can be begin that healing journey. I'd like to begin self-help support groups. Now this is about them coming together and sharing with one another how they're finding solutions that work for them on their recovery. Finding friendship, again, because they're isolating themselves, they, they don't have friends. Their only friends, as we, as we saw earlier, could be the, drunk, the, dr the drink or the drugs. It's a place for them to find their sense of identity. Back then, I didn't know what my likes were, I didn't know what my dislikes were. I didn't know what, as Paul said earlier, I didn't know who I wanted to be when I grew up. I was, wasn't confident enough to decide who I wanted to be when I grew up. <laughs> Well, certainly, if someone said to me, you will be a qualified counsellor psychotherapist, I think I would have run in the complete opposite direction. Um, workshops for the sexual abuse survivors. These topics will be about giving them healthy coping strategies, because up to this point, before they seek help, they have found coping strategies that are not healthy and not helpful. So yeah, it's about healthy coping strategies. Just things like healthy eating, having a healthy diet, exercising, keeping a journal, because keeping a journal, again, you feel safe. They can write down their thoughts and their feelings and even discover what their likes and dislikes are, maybe what they'd like to see their future as. 
gain and only trust and break free from the isolation. And self-affirming exercises. How many of us, I hope my mum doesn't mind, but she did something in here today as we were preparing. She was like, oh, I'm so stupid. It was like, no, you're not. <laughs> not stupid. We might do silly things sometimes, but we're not stupid. So yeah, self-affirming exercises. We don't need others to define who we are. I remember often looking in the mirror and seeing something. It wasn't a true reflection. I can remember those significant others that cared about me at the time. They would say, you're beautiful, you're clever, you're caring. But when I looked in the mirror, I didn't see that. So yeah, self-affirming exercises. We don't need others to define who we are. For the future, for Restore the Years, I would like to provide educative presentations for those, all those really, that work with young people. Um, just to provide topics, grooming for example, why, re why re victimisation happens. The internet also, as I'm sure we're all aware, especially those of us that are parents and grandparents, how vulnerable the young people are when they're on the internet. They, there's just the access, the things they have access to on the internet is scary. And in the future, online counselling. This will all be very confidential. And these are just words that mean something to victims and survivors. To find healing and to, to break that shattering silence where they can begin to speak the truth of what's happened to them. Restore the Years would like to raise an awareness. I'm sure... I don't know, what do you think? I think before all these high-profile cases that have been in the news, how many of us were actually aware of what's been going on behind the scenes and to the extent when you look at the statistics that I spoke about earlier? I know for myself, and I'm, I've been through it, I wasn't really aware of just how widespread this is. Just at the bottom, to facilitate clients in discovering their identity. To take them on that journey of recovery and finding freedom, self-worth, self-esteem, confidence, hope, trusting relationships and safe boundaries. I'd just like to finish with my heart really for Restore the Years. I think I'd like to say the reason, the, one of the main reasons why I'm here is because I feel encouraged. I feel this is what I've been through and that was my journey and was being the operative word. You hear me all right, sweet? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And actually this is possible. This is really possible. There are many, many victims out there that aren't getting the support that they need. They're not getting the unconditional love and acceptance and care. And I do feel that when this happens, the evidence is here. Healing can take place. You can become a fully functioning person where you can contribute to society and feel of worth and of value. And that is my heart for the story of yours. Thank you.